Hi there! I'm going to show you how to make use of ground on all layers. It has a few very nice advantages. It also has disadvantages, but I'll show you how to eliminate those disadvantages so you can take full advantage of the advantages. I've been doing this for over 30 years and I've picked up a few nice tricks along the road. Let's get started. So, just to be absolutely clear on what I mean by ground on all layers, here's an example. This is the power supply from my DA converter. You see basically ground on all layers. So there are two layers here which have a full ground plane, inner one and bottom. That's usually the stack up I use if I have space. Top layer and the inner two are used for traces. And you see everywhere where there are no traces, there is ground plane. That's what I mean by ground on all layers. So let's have a look at the pros and cons of putting ground on all layers. The first advantage is guaranteed copper balance. I'll explain that in a minute. The second advantage is cooling. There's so much copper on the board. The board is an excellent heat conductor and anyone who's ever had to solder a four layer with copper on all planes and try to get off an SMD component will know you really have to put a lot of energy in. Disadvantages, unwanted coupling to pieces of ground plane. If those pieces of ground plane in between traces are not connected to the main ground plane well enough, you can get resonances on them. We'll get back to that later, how to deal with that. It's also easy to forget to place a via at each ground point. Because you have this ground on all layers, all ground will definitely be connected. However, for good RF performance, you must have a via at each ground connection. Now, if you have a single ground plane, your editor software will warn you that there is a loose connection, but with all these layers, it will not warn you. I also have a strategy for that. And there's a possibility of crosstalk because of the previous point. If you don't place all the vias, then there will be some crosstalk. Now, let's see why copper balance is important. Copper balance can be a problem during production. What you see here is a cross section of a board where all four layers have the left side of the board filled with copper and the right side has no copper. Now, what happens during production? These boards are stacked. You see three boards here stacked on top of each other. They are stacked and compressed to bond all the layers together. Now you can imagine if the right half has no copper, this will not compress and this will not bond well. And this leads to your board delaminating. So that's why copper balance is important. So if you fill up all layers with ground, you have guaranteed copper balance and you never have to worry about it again. So let's look at the problem of unwanted coupling to pieces of ground plane. This is the test circuit we'll be using and we're going to send a signal over this transmission line here. Now it's going to couple to these planes to the left and right. Let's assume these vias are not here. These solder blobs are basically vias are created. Then the wave will get onto these planes and start bouncing around in all kinds of ways. At some points it will resonate and this will cause big dips in the transfer function of this transmission line. You can, you can see dips here, here and here. Now this only happens next to high speed digital or analog RF lines because it cannot occur at low frequencies. PCBs are simply too small for that. Now this problem can be prevented by placing vias like we've done here. And the question is, how many vias do we need? Now the theory behind it is something like this. If a wave doesn't fit between those two vias, it will not get on the plane. At a very low frequency, a wave will not fit between here because the wavelength of the signal is very long. At a very high frequency, it'll easily fit between these vias, get on a plane, starts bouncing around and ruin your performance like this. So we're going to measure the relationship between the distance of these vias and the frequency at which this coupling and resonant problem occurs. This is the first measurement result. We see the gain versus frequency for two different situations. Now in the first situation, the yellow situation, the yellow vias are placed. In the purple situation, the purple vias are added. So when we have the yellow vias, we have a distance of 87 millimeters. When we have the purple vias included, we have 43 millimeter distance. Now let's see what this does. With the yellow vias only, we get a resonance at 700 megahertz. If we add the purple vias, that doubles to 1.4 gigahertz. Hey, that's interesting. We half the distance, we get double the frequency. Let's have a look at the second measurement. We start with the yellow situation and we add the purple vias. So the distance goes from 43 millimeter to 22 millimeter. Now let's see what this does. In the yellow situation, we had 1.4 gigahertz. And in the purple situation, we have 2.8. Again, halving the distance, doubling the frequency. So now the question becomes, based on these measurements, can we calculate the maximum via distance we need? Now we already mentioned there's a relationship with wavelength. So we need to be able to calculate the wavelength. So what is the signal speed? We need that first. 
Now a signal speed on a coaxial cable or a transmission line is virtually always 0.66 times the speed of light, which is 200,000 meters per second. You can always take that as a rule of thumb as a starting point. The wavelength is the signal speed divided by the signal frequency. So now we can put this all together. We see a table here. We see the via distance in millimeters. We see the first frequency where a resonance occurs and we see the wavelength at these frequencies. Now if we divide the via distance and the wavelength, look at this amazing result. It's all 0.30 and probably this 0.32 is due to my terrible drilling skills as you can see on the picture the vias are a little bit all over the place. So the problems start occurring at 0.3 times the wavelength. Now this allows us to calculate it. If we put that v those vias at a maximum distance of 0.25 times the wavelength which is 0.25 times 200,000 meters a second divided by the maximum frequency then we're safe. Now this is in meters so be careful there. Now watch out with digital signals. Digital signals are square waves and square waves have harmonics and you need at least a ninth harmonic to make a square wave look a little bit like a square wave. So you need to plug in a nine times higher value in the formula. So a 100 megahertz clock, you would need to plug in 900 megahertz in the via distance calculation. Before we continue, I have a gift for you if you're interested. It's called the Electronic Product Development Checklist and it contains 30 years of my experience in the whole process from schematic to layout. You can get it for free by typing send me the checklist in the comments. Now let's continue. Now we're ready to draw some conclusions. Multiple ground planes are great for copper balance and thermal conductivity of your PCB. But place ground vias in plane next to RF and or high speed signal digital lines at a maximum distance of 0.25 times 200,000 meters per second divided by the maximum frequency. And that result is in meters. Now for digital signal lines, multiply this nine times. Other places where you have loose ground, just place regular vias in there. Now, if you want to be absolutely certain, you use this maximum via distance everywhere throughout your board. But if you're not close to high speed signal lines, it's, it's not really necessary. Now there's one problem we have left, that's the risk of missing a VIA. There is a way around that with uh, PCB layout software. So you start the layout with a single ground plane, for instance, on inner one. And then you place a VIA near each ground point. Your connectivity check will help here because as long as you don't place that VIA, there will be a connectivity problem. Now you have to be absolutely sure that you do not create ground traces on the top layer to connect to ground points because then you would also miss one of these ground locations. So this way of working forces a ground via at each ground connection. Now if your board is completely done, then you add ground planes on all layers. Now of course you have to be careful if you rework your board after that. The best thing to do is remove all these ground planes on other layers again and just make sure that each ground point has a via. Thank you for watching and making it this far. Check out part one, two, and three of this video series in the description. It explains a lot of RF basics that'll help you understand this video better. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. I'm going to try to make a living teaching electronics on YouTube and your likes and subscribes will really help me do that. See you next time.